So uh, my name is Brooklyn Zelenka. You can find me most places on the internet as Xpeed. And I am a distributed systems researcher um, and the editor of the UCAN and Interplanetary Virtual Machine Specs. Um, and UCAN uh, is a project that we started at my previous company, Fission, about four years ago to solve a really narrow problem um, that we had. And then a bunch of other people started picking it up and using it for all kinds of things that we didn't expect, sort of your typical open source um, uh, you know, ideal scenario, and it's ended up in all kinds of places, like CRDTs, file storage, databases, decentralized compute, name systems, email, all over the place. And we found a few people, like the team now known as Taracha, were using it as a distributed RPC framework. We thought, hey, that's pretty cool. And so we've now combined a lot of these things as part of this uh, 1.0 um, project. So as they tend to be, the 1.0 was a big community-centered undertaking. We ran directly into second system syndrome like you tend to, because we're saying we're going to lock all the features. If you want your thing to get in, it better get in now. Um, but it also gave us the ability to take a step back and say, we've sort of bolted on a bunch of features over the years. Can we streamline that? So as people are getting their last minute you know, changes in, can we streamline this whole system, make it smaller, make it, quote, simpler? And at least for me, one of the big takeaways was that simplicity is a great goal, but it's not a, the end in itself. It is always in service of leverage. So you want to have a really small, um, uh, tight API, but that has to be highly, highly leverageable. So we went with, a, you know, at one point, a much larger API, and then we got it really small, and we we're cutting out use cases. And I'm actually really happy with where we, um, where we fit into that. And that all came from feedback from actually a lot of people in this room even um, deciding which use cases were the most important, the most impactful for us to really um, refine, um, refine that API. So uh, I'm going to do a quick crash course on UCAN for anybody who's not already familiar. Um, and this is like the lightning speed version of this. So why a new auth system at all? Well, unlike in Web 2.0, which is client server, we have a very heterogeneous network. So you can have data that doesn't really live anywhere, right? It's content addressed, it's a CRDT, all of these things. And we need to make requests that go from, you know, from your browser or directly on your device, you know, it's an iOS app, into WebAssembly, to Cloudflare, to IPFS, into BitTorrent, all over the place, right? And a problem with traditional access control, access control lists, is if you have more than two principles, so more than a client and server, it can become confusing who's making the request. If I make a request to you and you forward it on to somebody else, should I be using, uh, should that request be using my authority or should it be using the, the, this uh, delegate in the middle's authority? And so the style of auth that we use gets rid of this problem completely. The, the problem around it is called confused deputy and capability systems um, remove this problem entirely, and it's very much designed for this distributed world, unlike an access control list, which assumes everything is on one machine. So a uh, really high level certificate capability model flow looks like this. Here's Alice. Alice wants to communicate with some service. That service issues her a cryptographically secure certificate aimed at her public key. So both of these uh, agents have public keys. She wants to use that. She now makes a request that includes the CID of that certificate in it and signs over the whole thing and says, I'm sending this back to you using your public key. So we have this end-to-end -end, um, uh, signed system. This request has all of the information required to fulfill the request, so it's stateless. And uh, there is no other auth server or anything between this service, that gear, could be a single row in a database, or it could be a mail server, or whatever the granularity is, it doesn't matter. It just needs to have a public key associated with it. Okay, so that's great, that's a very simple version, but if I want to add other people, I don't wanna to have to keep going back through that service. Maybe the service is down, maybe I'm on an airplane and I'm sitting next to somebody and they're on Bluetooth and I want to send them a certificate as well. So I can now create a sub-delegation from Alice to Bob using Bob's public key and my private key. And now Bob has the ability to talk to the service again without anybody else having to be online, as long as in that request we include both of those certificates. And then this, um, this is self-verifying now. 
So one of the, the core insights for you know, a, a mid-2020s um, uh, application with capabilities is that agents are abundant, there are relatively few humans in the system, and there's quite a lot of software in the middle. Uh, a lot of servers um, and now AI agents as well. We want to be able to scope our uh, capabilities down to what a single agent can do. So this could be a, a throwaway process that's going to be around for 30 seconds and then get shut down. As long as it has a key pair, you can address it directly. And at every time you do that delegation step, you can always shrink down what it's allowed to do. So if you have access to the entire database, you can say, well, just this table or just this row. So even if your LLM starts hallucinating all kinds of things off of your uh, request, you've already restricted it down to, no, you're only allowed to mutate stuff in this one table. So the blast radius is intentionally kept very, very, very small. And they can never escape that um, by increasing their, um, their capabilities. We're going to talk about a few of these pieces today, uh, so just to give you a very high level understanding of how everything fits together, and then we'll dive into these uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, for anybody that's been using UCAN for a long time, delegation is where we started. So that's that passing um, certificates between people, delegating authority without, delegating the, uh, without handing off the key. Invocation was something that we were doing outside of UCAN, the libraries, or outside of the specs, that we decided to pull in because unless you're an expert in this stuff, this was confusing. So we've just said, there's an invocation spec. It's an RPC style thing that's signed that you include CIDs inside of, just like I showed in that uh, um, diagram earlier, um, that prove that you're allowed to make that invocation. We used to have a revocation system that invalidates delegations. That was a separate thing. Now that we have invocations, a revocation is just a kind of invocation. You say, I have the ability to revoke this thing. Here's my proof that I'm allowed to do it. And then that cuts off a delegation, which then invalidates somebody's ability to invoke things. Promises, um, we'll talk about a, a little bit more, but you can essentially think of them as async awaits, but on distributed processes. Um, and we'll go into that a little bit more, but that lets you build up graphs of computation or queue things into a system uh, with a single line of code that uh, doesn't increase the sur really the surface area of this essentially at all, and is very, very powerful. It's something that we pulled in from IPVM and brought into UCAN because we were just finding way more uses for it than, than we initially expected. So let's start with um, first change that we made, interplanetification. From UCAN uh, 0.1 through 0.10, so all of the stuff up until the, the 1.0, uh, it was based on JWT because the idea was JWT is familiar to web developers. They'll be able to use this, adopt it, and it'll be an, a nice adoption strategy. And that worked like a little bit, but we ended up having to sort of like fake it a bit because you had this JWT inside, it was really DAG JSON because we needed the CIDs, all of this stuff, right? So, and then most 95% of people using UCAN were actually using just straight up IPLD and then converting to JWT to meet the spec. There were even uh, side specs, so Web3 Storage built uh, UCAN IPLD so that they could have like more efficient storage. And at some point we said, you know what, everybody's already using IPLD, we'll just make it IPLD. JWT has a bunch of security issues with off-the-shelf libraries. You have to do a bunch of extra checking, all of these things. Let's just make it IPLD and make this problem go away. And that's actually been really, really nice and has simplified problems for us um, uh, throughout the spec. Specifically, we use DAG Seabor. So you can transport in whatever you want. You can store it however you feel like. You want it in DAG YAML, go for it. You have to sign DAG Seabor. So everybody in the system has to support DAG Seabor. Um, we already canonicalized things using uh, IPLD. And uh, as much as we could support, you signed over DAG JSON, you signed over DAG Seabor, et cetera. Just having the one reduces the amount that we have to ship to every client. Um, cryptogra cryptographic agility, so the ability to add more um, uh, things to your crypto suite over time, is helpful if you want to evolve over time. Not to say, and I think this is something that confuses a lot of people with multi-formats, it's not to say we support everything, it's so that you can specify, hey, this is what I'm using. And in our spec, we say we are using DAG Seabor. Yeah. Um, and specifically, we use the multi-format Varsig, we couldn't call it multi-sig, obviously, uh, which is the uh, multi-format for signed IPLD. 
Um, invocations. So again, this used to exist outside of the core specs, and we've now pulled it in. Here's a concrete example given as DAG.JSON because it's more readable than Cbor for, for humans. Um, and I've color coded it for you. So the, uh, in that purplish color, issue an audience, this is the to and from. So when Alice is delegating to Bob or Alice is um, invoking at the email server, Alice is the issuer, audience is the email server. This blue section is the actual like function call portion of it. So I say, this is about a mail server. The command is email send, that's my function name. And then my arguments uh, are the two, CC, subject, and body. And then a nonce to uniquely identify it, the CIDs of the delegation proofs, and a, a UTC uh, expiry. And we're going to focus in on commands here. So the, effectively, the, the function names. Something we had talked about for a long time, and I think the issue was open for something like two years, was a standard command library. So you, this is fully extensible. You can put whatever you want in there. But having some starter place for it for that handles the 99% you know, percent use case um, is really helpful. Because then all the libraries can just understand them. It makes it really easy. And basically what these give you is a function name and a function signature. So message send has a two subject and a body and receive won't have a body on it. So you now can at least do a little bit of validation of what am I allowed to put into my function call, my distributed function call. There's a special one, so we've uh, reserved for first party things, uh, the you can namespace. So anything slash you can, you're not allowed to write, that's specifically for specs, and you can revoke is how we do revocation. So in distributed auth, because you're not always going through a auth server, you always want to reduce down what somebody's able to do, but even then, maybe you trusted somebody, maybe I delegated something to Juan, but then it turns out somebody broke into Juan's laptop, and now it's a, a malicious agent. I need to be able to go and retract that, um, that delegation at a later point. This is always eventually consistent, um, so it's not that it happens instantly, um, so it's why it's your last resort, but it's something that we needed to add to the system. So here's uh, a concrete scenario. We have Alice delegated to Bob, delegated to Carol, delegated to Mallory. And Bob discovers that Mallory is a bad actor and issues this uh, revocation on the side. And basically, Bob is able to, because Bob is in this portion of the delegation chain, this bottom uh, three quarters, um, doesn't need any in that blue, doesn't need any proofs, but does need to show I'm in the chain of the thing that I'm revoking. So issues this revocation, and that breaks that link and says, you're not allowed to use my authority in your chain anymore. No good. And has to broadcast this at least to who the resource was about. So if this is a mail server, really easy. You just send it to the mail server, and you're done. If this is a CRDT, and it's replicated in a bunch of places, then you have to uh, rep, yeah, send this out as broadly as possible, right, until all the replicas get hit. If it turns out later that Bob was mistaken, or maybe Bob was um, uh, a bad actor, like it was actually Bob that was the malicious one, um, then if I had, say, this other person, this fireman, they could redelegate to Mallory and heal this divide. And everyone that Mallory had delegated to would continue to work again. Invocations also now include promises. So uh, as we move into this more distributed world, um, in distributed systems, we think a lot about the speed of light. Um, I heard recently it's uh, four inches per clock cycle, right, is, uh, is, is how fast you can go. So it's actually, in computer time, it's actually really, really slow. Having a lot of round trips it just destroys performance. So we went into the literature and we found distributed promises, which let you say, okay, uh, I want you to run this entire graph of computation, and maybe that runs across eight machines. And when this finishes, call that machine, call this machine, and we can send that all in one go. Or if you have a long-running process, so you're doing video transcoding, and it's going to take 20 minutes, and you realize 10 minutes in that process, oh, you know, I really needed to do this, this thing next, but I'm about to get on a plane, you can send to that uh, server, hey, when you're done with that, start this next job, and I'm going to close my laptop and get on a plane and be disconnected. So we're not always going back and forth. We're not incurring all of that latency. We can just queue up a bunch of jobs and let it run without having to wait for the response and send the next thing and get a response and the next thing and get a response. 
This requires a different form of addressing. We call the, these tasks and the addressing task IDs. It uses a form of addressing called input addressing, which we didn't invent. This is you know, older stuff. And basically, it says it doesn't matter who the issue audience or the proofs are. The identifier for a task, for a job, is just these fields. These are the semantic fields, including the nonce. So in this case, I'm sending an email with these fields, and it's uniquely identified by uh, the SID, so still the hash of these. Um, and now if two of us had sent the same request at the same time with the same nonce, it can deduplicate those. So in a distributed system, unless we want to do coordination, which we're trying to avoid, right, trying to be latency sensitive, um, then uh, uh, this gives us this uniqueness. And we have to do this because unlike content addressing, where you have exactly the content, we don't know what the output's going to be. So we need to address it by the input, not by the output. And this lets us then um, replace any field in the arguments with a you can slash awaits, and then this tuple of a path, so a JQ style selector, into what will come back, and the uh, SID of the task ID. And now that, yeah, which is that, that box there. And this lets us both, like I was saying before, let you build up these graphs of computation which is already helpful. This is already a, a massive improvement for latency, um, partition tolerance, all of this stuff. But we've been discovering also lets you describe protocols, distributed protocols, using promises. By outlining like this, you can do distributed control flow, you can do failover, all of these things described in these nice graphs now. Delegation. So delegation has always worked uh, mostly like this, but we've had to make one tweak. There was a, uh, an edge case before in a delegation where the spec was very clear how this should work, but it wasn't immediately obvious to users. So we've added a new field called subject. And the initial issuer, so who's doing that first delegation, has to match the subject, and then we thread the subject through every other um, delegation. So we know the email server sent this to me, they were the first one, this is about them. Cool, we know we've bottomed out on the, the root authority because it's self-certifying now, because those two match. And every other delegation says, this is about the email server, this is about the email server. Then we have to make sure that the to and froms match up. So this got delegated to me, and then I delegated to somebody else, and they delegated to somebody else. We make sure those match up. And that the things that you're allowed to do always shrink. At every delegation, we're always getting smaller, as mentioned before. How do we make those smaller? The way we used to do this was it was just a completely open field. You could put any IPLD in there and the reci recipient had to know how to interpret that. But that's a little bit dangerous when you have lots of different actors um, interacting. They all have to have the same implementation now. So we said, well, what if we took um, a minimal policy language? It is JQ style selectors and 11, um, uh, 11 functions, 11 operators, even if you include greater than and greater than and equal to, right? Um, so it's just math, um, you know, comparisons, inequalities, uh, string matching, so um, globs, not and, or, and every and some, and that's it. Um, and JQ style selectors, it is like 99% identical to JQ. JQ actually works on streams. We don't work on streams because we're just looking at um, concrete um, IPLD. And really what all we're saying is, okay, in the arguments, when you eventually go to invoke this, planet name, uh, the field planet, and then inside of that name, must equal Saturn. Or team three size has to be four, and the CEO's first name needs to be Juan. Right? And so we can build these up, and it's run totally syntactically. You don't have to understand how it's going to be interpreted, you just look at the arguments and make sure that they fit. This runs incredibly fast. It's guaranteed to terminate. It's tree structured so that you can run, the, run it in parallel if you want to get it really blazing. Um, and has actually turned out, we, at one point we went much larger with this, with um, ability to compare parts of the structure together, all of these things. And this minimal set has turned out to be, um, uh, to fit really nicely all of the use cases that we found for it so far. The JQ style selectors 
give us a familiar, friendly way now to address into IPLD. So a little bit like IPLD selectors, but in this familiar JQ style. Uh, and in fact, you can take um, DAG JSON, plug it into JQ, and again, with one or two small edge cases, you can uh, run it literally through JQ uh, to, to debug locally. Concretely, this looks like so. So here's my delegation, right? And it says, you know, my sub and, and command and the policy there. And uh, my invocation is here in the bottom right. Um, and I just check that all of these things match and that my, um, you know, foo.bar is greater than 42. It's 100. That succeeds. And the previous link has to be equal to this hash. We don't know anything about hash linking. We've just described, using very basic operators, syntactically how this has to work. So, to wrap up, um, 1.0, there's a few implementations. Uh, RSUCAN 0.5 um, has a native Rust uh, implementation that works today. We will have WebAssembly very soon. Um, Ucanto, which is the Storacha, um, used to be Web3 Storage, maintained, now Storacha, JavaScript, ucan based RPC framework, um, where we pulled a lot of the RPC stuff from originally, uh, is being updated to the latest spec uh, right now as well. So that should be done in the next few weeks. If you want to get involved, uh, you can always find us at uh, github.com slash UCAN working group, and we do community calls at luma slash we can. Thanks.